Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mark Cerny. I began making games almost 20 years ago. Uh, in all that time, I've never spoken, uh, principally because I'm terrified of standing up in public and talking, but also because I haven't had much to say. Well, today I have something to say, which is I love what I do. And yet, being in this unique, wonderful industry requires the enthusiastic involvement of many others who may not share my core values. So today, I have an incredible opportunity. A captive audience and an hour to make a case for what I believe makes development really click for character action games. Hopefully, other genres as well. I call it method. Method is built on four keystones. I should say that these are not a timeline. These are just various aspects of the methodology. Uh, Pre-production versus production. The creation of the game is split into two phases. Pre-production, the chaotic first phase in which the game's design takes place, uh, takes form, I should say, and production, the second phase of the project, uh, during which you build the game. These two phases are as different as night and day. At the end of pre-production, there are two deliverables. The first deliverable is the publishable first playable. This is a non-traditional first playable in that it is a completely polished portion of the game and that it determines whether or not the project will live or die. For the project to continue, this publishable first playable must, as a standalone piece of entertainment, be so compelling that all concerned are confident that the game will succeed in the marketplace of one or two years hence. The second deliverable is something called the macro design. In method, traditional design documentation is completely discarded. Instead, the design is split into macro and micro designs. The macro design is a five-page document that gives the framework that your game fits into and is a deliverable at the end of pre-production. The micro design is what your game is and is created on the fly during production. By separating these two, you can make a creative game that is still coherent and fun to play. Finally, Gameplay testing. At anything up to 10 times during the project, play sessions are organized with a variety of consumers, both in the perceived target audience and outside of it. Among other things, this provides an opportunity to find out what parts of the game work well and which don't. As a result, strengths can be played to and weaknesses fixed. Bifurcate the process. I believe that one of the paramount reasons game development is, is so hard is that it requires working within two entirely distinct disciplines and methodologies. And just to make sure it's extra hard, we ask the, the same people to do both. I describe the two disciplines using a metaphor. Capturing lightning versus making the game. Games are engineering. They're also art. At some point in each project, we are just looking for that lightning strike of inspiration that core concept or feature that will set us apart in the very crowded marketplace. Here are some less colorful terms. Pre-production versus production. This section of method is really about pre-production. Production is easy. You just make your game. Pre-production is hard. In fact, pre-production is so hard, lots of teams just skip it or give it short shrift and move on into production. I believe that 80%, I'm not exaggerating, of mistakes in game development are a direct result of things that were done or not done in pre-production. These mistakes, of course, are the result of a myth, one of my personal favorites. It is possible to plan and schedule the creation of your game. This is a myth. You have a, a core concept uh, excuse me, a game concept and a core team. I'll get back to that later. And the first thing you do is you make a plan and uh, then just admit it, we've all done this, you make a schedule. Well, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because planning and scheduling, at least planning and scheduling the way we're usually accustomed to, are anathema to the true nature of pre-production, wherein we are asking for fresh answers to the eternal question, what is gameplay? Now, 
I'm not saying you shouldn't have a process by which you will either build your game design or come to the conclusion that your game concept or your core team is not strong enough. In fact, having a process and using it is the first part of method. And since the majority of the bad habits fall into pre-production, uh, I'll be spending most of the time today on pre-production. Somehow, we have to avoid two bad habits that are very easy to slip into, planning and scheduling. Pre-production must be allowed to be a chaotic process. You can't plan when inspiration will strike, and you can't schedule the date when you will have worked out all of your seemingly intractable problems. It's not just a bad idea to schedule, it's impossible. And those who do plan and schedule pre-production end up in one of two boats. Those who are so frustrated or disillusioned that they cancel the project, or those who build a project that is not yet ready and therefore carries all of its deficiencies over into production. So, no uh, long-term planning or scheduling. How do you manage chaos? Well, first, assemble the core team. Pre-production is hard. So, who do you give your hardest projects to? Unfortunately, it's a common habit to kick off pre-production using junior members who are available because you can pull them off of other teams or because you just hired them. Uh, this, of course, is wrong. Uh, since pre-production does not require a large team, but it, it does require your best and probably your highest paid staff. This core team will determine everything that's important about your game and most likely become your team leaders in production. So get the pe best people you can possibly find and, and get them early. Then write, start writing checks because pre-production will not be cheap. I'll give you a rough number, which is that you should expect to spend a million dollars before you know what your game is. Now, if this sounds like a license to, to uh, blow a million dollars, it's because it is. Uh, however, by being cost inefficient during pre-production, you're in fact being cost efficient vis-a-vis -vis the actual production of the game. That's because if it's not going to work out, you only blew a million dollars. You could blow a lot more, believe me. And, and I'll argue this firm, fervently, it's the only way to give yourself a proper chance of making a good game. So, back to that top-notch team. What are they doing with that million dollars? They're prototyping. I'm sure a lot of you are already doing this, either using your game engine or uh, even uh, a completely separate engine. So I don't have to tell you how much you learn from making prototypes. Specifically, the team is making lots of successive prototypes. It's important uh, not to wait before you, you start making these prototypes. Take the pieces that you have, however sketchy, and uh, build the best you can. Because prototypes are where you learn. And these prototypes are targeted in a certain way, in that the prototypes eventually become indistinguishable from game levels. Sure, bits and pieces of gameplay are checked out during pre-production, but at some point, the team shifts over to what I call real-level prototypes, where each prototype brings together artwork, game mechanics, and technology to show an entire level of a game that could be were you just to finish it. So you're in a cycle. You make a level, you and others play it. You find it wanting in some way. You change your goals or your approach. And then you put it aside and you start making the next level. Here's where you run head to head with another myth of development. Working productively means throwing out nothing. I'm going to give you a number. That number is five. Your fifth level prototype is where I predict that you'll have defined your game. If you're really good, you might be able to do it in four. And hey, if you're on a team that's been together for a while, working with fami familiar hardware in a familiar genre, maybe, just maybe, three. At any rate, five real-level prototypes means that you're going to discard four completed levels of your game. By the way, games in this category tend to have about 20 levels. So we're talking about 20% of a game here. If you care at all about efficient asset management, this is the time for you to kick that habit and throw out some good work. In fact, throughout pre-production, you will not create any material designed to be played by the public. If you're very lucky, you might find a use for some of the best of your work, but don't count for it, and for God's sake, don't schedule on that basis. As a matter of fact, let's just make that part of the definition of pre-production. You are not making a game. Not yet, anyway. This sounds frustrating and difficult, and to uh, managers, it sounds 
half-assed and unschedulable. And all this is, is of course, true. But if just you've successfully kicked these bad habits, planning, scheduling, saving money, efficient asset management, you'll be fine. So what are you doing during, pre doing during pre-production? Well, through these real-level prototypes, you're building your game design. By game design, I mean the following things. First, the three Cs, character, camera, and control. You can't create any meaningful gameplay prototypes until these things are complete, or nearly so. Character means that you know what the, the game's character looks like, uh, how it moves, and how the animation supports the moveset. Camera is always a tough problem and requires not only a fair amount of work, but also a basic philosophy of camera motion. Will it be more or less responsive, near or far, uh, biased in certain directions? You also have to look at how it supports your gameplay. Control is how the first two integrate with the game controller into something that's somehow fun. The three C's are somewhat specific for uh, the character action game genre, but there are analogs in every genre. Uh, for example, you might replace the word control with uh, interface in a real-time strategy game or character with car in a driving game. Next, your game's look. In order to be successful, a game must have a unique and compelling look. You have to have this look nailed and in the game, not in pre-rendered artwork or uh, sketches, before you can even consider leaving pre-production. Completed key technology. If there's any technology that's vital to how your game will feel to the player, it has to be created during pre-production. In the case of uh, Spyro and Jack and Daxter, this was a engine that could do exceptionally, um, could do long views exceptionally well on the hardware. Uh, in the case of Luigi's Mansion, uh, all the real-time lighting effects needed to be complete before gameplay could be called ready. Uh, in the case of Command and Conquer, uh, you'd better know how pathfinding is going to work for all those units, and so on. Finally, in the case of a holistic game, you also need to know the bulk of your individual game elements and you probably need to know your story as well. Now, what I mean by a holistic game is a game in which the various levels or areas are tightly interrelated by uh, inventory, story, or similar aspects. The uh, opposite would be sequential, in which each level or area more or less stands on its own. So, to give an example, uh, Zelda is a holistic game, while Jack and Daxter despite being built in a nonlinear fashion, is fundamentally a sequential game. Holistic games have special requirements in pre-production uh, because the whole game represents an uh, interrelated puzzle to be solved by the designer. This puzzle must, of course, be resolved prior to entering production. At any rate, looking at this list, I don't think anyone would disagree if I said that pre-production, as I've defined it, is really bloody difficult. Uh, there's a fair question, however, which is, why is all of this so important to achieve before building the first level of the published product? In order to get a game design worth building, you have to take chances. You have to try your best guesses at how your game will work and, and do it in as real a setting as you can put together. Taking chances means leap before you look. Once you're in production, you'll always want to think through very carefully what you intend to do before you do it. While you're in pre-production, however, you, you think of what seems like a good idea, and you just try it. Taking chances during pre-production means that you might find yourself doing some of the following things. Building levels without complete knowledge of your character's moveset. Building levels without knowing the real limits of your technology. Or not knowing the global context of the piece of the game you're working on. Or so on. All of these are absolutely terrible things to be doing during production, and in fact, signs that your project is in serious trouble. In pre-production, however, these are exactly the kinds of things that you want to be doing. This is this uh, vital chaos that I keep talking about. When your prototype ideas crash and burn, who cares? You are throwing them out anyway. Uh, you can immediately, painlessly figure out what about your idea didn't work and try the next great idea. From a financial standpoint, and this is uh, also a metaphor for what you're doing inside of the development team, this is about spending money now to save money later. Ask yourself, 
Have you ever canceled a project near completion? Wouldn't you rather have done five prototype levels before, fu be, hmm, before fully funding it? So that's it, pre-production, the most important phase of your game development. On to the next myth, technology. Cutting edge technology is very important, so build your technology first. Now, now I love technology. Personally, I believe that this is one of the three major components of the game, along with design and art, and that by having good technology, you can stack the deck in your favor. The last three titles I've worked on have uh, all had a major technology basis. For example, Crash Bandicoot, uh, streaming technology let us have a dense, organic look that uh, instantly set us apart from competing products. It also let us have very long, load-free levels. Let's look at when in the process this technology should get created. In the conventional development model, the order is as follows. First you write the design, then engineering extracts the technology requirements, then you build the technology, then you build the game. Why this order? Well, you can't do the game of art and programming before you do the uh, game engine, can you? Which, which means that the game engine has to come first. Or to put this in Gantt chart terms, if you have a significant task that is a dependency for multiple other tasks, uh, put it first. Now, this is all well and good, but it presupposes that we know where we're heading when we start out. And it also eliminates any chance of prototyping gameplay, because before any of the game is playable, we're already in full-blown full production of levels. Here's the alternative. Double track it. Yes, create your cutting-edge technology, but also have a second technology track that lets you experiment with gameplay. It needs to be functional, but not necessarily pretty, so you may be able to borrow it or purchase it cheaply. To give an example, let's say we're making Jack and Daxter. It's early in the project, uh, but we have a pretty good idea that we want, know we want to do large, detailed levels uh, with infinite views. So part of the engineering team is working on level of detail technology. At the same time, we quickly write an engine that does not use level of detail and use that engine to display prototype levels. Since this quick and dirty engine does not use level of detail, we, we do have some issues. We have to restrict the view distance. We have to avoid displaying any far objects or parts of the scene. But, but, we have enough of an engine to start working on Jack's movesets, uh, enemy behavior, even the look of the levels. Later on, but still while we're in pre-production, we can take what we found out about the level requirements, such as their size and polygon count, and uh, bring that to the engineering team that's making the real level of detail engine and use it to fine tune the engine specifications. On to the next myth, milestones. Frequent project review is essential to good management. Milestones are a wonderful thing during production. They allow you to break your game into manageable chunks and set deadlines to track your progress. Having said that, traditional milestones have no place in pre-production. Pre-production is chaotic, somewhat disorganized, and definitely does not produce predictable results. And yet, there is an expectation out there that teams in pre-production can produce viewable, playable milestones for internal and external review. Now, in production, it's uh, not too tricky to juggle the order of tasks in order to create a demo or bring all aspects of the game together uh, for a milestone. In pre-production, on the other hand, not only will the milestone have little resemblance to the final product, uh, it will also do significant damage to the pre-production process. Every milestone involves putting in special effort. In pre-production, this special effort is expressly subtracted from effort that could have been put into pre-production of the game. So, pre-production and milestones. If the team needs offline status, with no formal milestones during pre-production, to what extent can the process be managed? Well, as a start, there can be a pre-negotiated term for pre-production. Pre that is, a limit on how long it can continue, since clearly if no progress is being made, continued experimentation does not benefit the team, the project, or the publisher. It also helps to have strict deliverables for the end, 
of pre-production, namely the first playable and the macro design. I have a checklist for each of these that I'll go through later. Additionally, the results of pre-production experiments can be, can be made visible externally. Although traditional milestones can't be scheduled, the team will be in a rapid prototyping cycle, which means that all of the parts for a brand new experiment will be coming together every month or two. The point is that the timing of these builds is determined by the natural flow of the work, not by external factors. Net net, the uh, team needs to invite management in whenever practical. One caution here based on personal experience. At times I've been the one planning the experiments and inviting in management, and I can say the most distressing result of these meetings has been what I call the stench of failure. The lack of understanding that these are experiments and will all be flawed to one degree or another. If they weren't flawed, we'd be done well, with pre-production, right? So it's crucial to have a corporate culture in which it's understood how different a pre-production experiment is from a production milestone. Back to the deliverables. As I said earlier, there are two deliverables at the end of pre-production. The publishable first playable and the macro game design. Let's start with the first playable. There's a bit of, bit of confusion out there about what a first playable is, let alone a publishable first playable. Here's one of my favorite myths. Alpha equals first playable. I have seen, with my own eyes, games in which the gameplay was not finalized, the look did not come together, the whole thing wasn't defined until all of the levels were built. This seems like a worst case, and it is, but I also think it's a lot more common than any of us would want to admit. If you don't take your first playable milestone seriously, and by that, mean, by that I mean you don't move forward until it's done, you'll end up in this situation before you even know what hit you. First playable is when you can look at your playable game and say, I know exactly what this game is, and I know exactly how I'm going to build it, and it is really, really good. I call this your slice of heaven. So what is this slice of heaven, anyway? Well, first I favor a two-level first playable, so it contains a little variety. In a hypothetical Crash Bandicoot first playable, this would not only include the run and jump stuff, but also a second level where Crash runs away from a giant boulder uh, towards the camera. This second level would prove that Crash has that special something that makes it sellable. I also favor a very rigorous first playable in that it contains all local features and any global features that are required to make a level work. This first playable proves that you precisely understand what your game is and what it is not, and that you know enough to produce the game. It delineates pre-production, where you know nothing, from production, where you know everything. As for the publishable quality, having a rigorous first playable is about not getting ahead of yourself. You're trying to show that your game is sufficiently compelling that it will be marketable 12 to 18 months from now. If your look doesn't overpower everything on the market, go back and fix it. If your gameplay isn't exciting, go back and fix it. Publishable quality means literally that, that an uninitiated consumer will look at it, believe that it is a level from a commercial product, and be impressed by it. If you think you have a first playable in hand, here's a quick checklist. Uh, two levels of publishable quality with Player behavior fully defined. Uh, can you demonstrate everything your player character is going to do in the game? Are all your character's base moves completely defined and animated? Does the animation look great? Does the personality of my character feel fully formed? Enemy and obstacle behavior fully defined. This goes hand in hand with player behavior. Can the player character interact fully with all enemies and or obstacles? Uh, are the representative examples well animated? Uh, does the whole interaction between player character and enemy feel great? Uh, all local features included, global features included as required. This is very dependent on the particular game you're making. Are there pickups or power-ups? Are they in? Uh, if you have a mission structure, is it working? Is it fun? Uh, if NPCs give you your missions, uh, have you properly implemented them? Basic technology is done. 
Hopefully your technology in improves over the course of the project, but after first playable, you're not counting on it. So is your engine including any uh, killer features you are counting on up to speed? Are all gameplay necessary features, like the lighting in Luigi's Mansion, fully functional and looking good? Art direction in place. What's this game going to look like? Your in-game art should convince all concerned that it has that killer look. A touch of variety. No game can stand on a single leg of basic behavior. So you have to have variety, and your, your first playable has to de demonstrate what sort of variety you're targeting and exactly how it works and feels. So is this variety going to be sufficient? Is it good? Finally, the scope of the game is defined. What's the size of an area, stage, or level? How many of these levels will you need? By the way, one of the great benefits of a rigorous first playable is that constructing a project schedule becomes almost trivial. For example, how long does it take to put together a level? You don't have to work this one out a priori. You can just look at how long it took you to put together the levels in the first playable. I want to throw this out too, which is that while this is not the main intent of first playable, it does represent your first opportunity to put the game in front of consumers. Do this. Note in detail how your players pick up the control, whether they struggle with the camera, whether it's too easy or too hard, and, of course, whether they seem to be finding it compelling. If anything's wrong, now's the time to fix it. Let's take a worst case, which is that after months of effort, you realize you're not going to get to the bottom of that checklist. Or perhaps you did, and the game bombed unmistakably in the hands of consumers. This brings us to our next myth. A canceled project is a sign of bad management or a bad team. Well, no, actually, a canceled project is sometimes something to be very proud of. Regardless of the talent of the team, if you can't reach compelling first playable, it's time to kill the project and move on. Folks, you just saved yourself several million dollars and a year of the team's lives. So when and why would you stop the project? Well, as, uh, as unlikely as it sounds, it's very common to discover that the team simply cannot assemble everything required for a publishable first playable. If so, cancel, because if you can't get past the logistics of assembling two completed levels, you certainly can't make an entire game. This is usually a consequence of not having put the best and brightest on the project during pre-production. The more likely cancellation scenario is that you create your publishable first playable and find out that you have a game not worth publishing, even if you were to release it today. Canceling a project at this point is a very hard call, especially due to the invo emotional involvement of all concerned. Um, but do it. This is the central thesis of method, that your project will not miraculously get better during production. That you must compare your first playable with published products in your category, and your first playable has to be better. All right, time to get to the second deliverable at the end of pre-production, the macro design. Splitting the project, uh, splitting the design, excuse me, into two components, the macro and the micro, is the third keystone of method. The macro design is completed by the end of pre-production. The micro design is created during production. This development is the result of one of the most, sorry, this methodology is the result of one of the most dangerous myths in game development. The more defined your initial vision, the better. Let me restate this. I need a 100-page document describing my game. Okay. Forget it. Not only do you not need this document to start your game, you don't need this document ever. Now, I have a reputation uh, in certain circles as being anti-documentation. I consider this a badge of honor. In my opinion, the single worst thing you can do at the start of pre-production is to sit down and write a 100-page design document. And here are explicit reasons why. It's a waste of resources. Even in the best cases, documentation is uh, a necessary evil, along with everything else that does not either feed directly into the game or the marketing. No matter how great it is, I guarantee you, no player will ever enjoy your game design document. 
It's deceptive in that it gives the appearance that you know more than you really do. Is your character really 2.5 meters tall? Uh, do you really know that a castle will look good when built by your artists with your tools? And it's misleading in that it perpetuates the myth that you can plan your game in detail before you start building it. Finally, it sets uh, design prior to fundamentals being established. Let's say you've, uh, you've designed gameplay within your document and you have the assumption that your player character has a simple punch move. Then, during pre-production, you find a combo system for your punches that's completely new, intuitive, and fun. Guess what? All that gameplay you've designed for the single punch is now moot. Now, am I really anti-documentation? Certainly not. At the end of pre-production, I believe you should have a very nice five-page macro design document, which completely encompasses all you need to enter full production. Now, five pages might sound pretty short for the macro design, but have no fear. It's just enough to fill in where the prototype left off and to show the overall scope and organization of the game. The contents of the, of the five-page macro design are brief descriptions of the following. First, uh, character and moveset. This is the fundamentals of the gameplay as verified by the prototype. What are the basic moves? Who is the character? What are the special moves? How far can the character jump? How high? Exotic mechanics. Does the character ride vehicles? Use gizmos? What are rough concepts for each of these objects? Uh, level structure, size, and count. Uh, what is in a level? Is it uh, an area or a path? How large or long is a level? How many levels are there? Level contents. What is the player doing in the levels? A single mission? Multiple missions? Walking down a path? If there are missions, how are they presented to the player? Overarching structure. How do the levels fit together? Is it fundamentally a linear progression like Crash 1 or a hub system like Crash 2 or Spire of the Dragon? Uh, how are bosses used in the game? Are they in their own levels or combined into regular levels? Finally, there's a macro chart that shows what sort of gameplay goes where in the game. There are a lot of things implicit in this chart. Uh, knowledge of the planned variety of the game, uh, the scope of the game, its high-level structure. Every mechanic that you intend to use should be in this chart. Here's a macro chart for a hypothetical game that is a cross between Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon. For the sake of legibility in this venue, it only has uh, information for the first seven levels. Each row describes one of the levels. The relevant information changes from game to game, but in this case, it's the locale of the level, whether it's a 3D or 2D level, uh, what exotic gameplay it contains, what the player must have collected in order to enter the level, and finally, what objects can be collected in the level. The first thing you should notice about the chart is it all fits on one page. If it's all on one page, you can see at a glance how your game shapes up. Uh, is all gameplay of a certain type bunched at the end or the beginning? Are abilities and moves introduced and trained in a smooth distribution? Uh, do my barriers to level entry progress properly? The second thing about the chart is that when you make it, which is directly after delivery of first playable, there will be some unknowns in it. Uh, that's okay as long as there's no dependencies on the unknowns. In, in this particular macro chart, the locales of levels 5 and 7 have not yet been determined. At any rate, a good macro design will set you in ideal stead for your production design, for, excuse me, your production phase, because you know the scope of the game on a macro level and can therefore accurately schedule the micro level, aka production. The macro chart provides a tool for tracking progress in production. Uh, a strong macro prevents feature creep and feature drop in production. And finally, uh, sub-teams, meaning the uh, actual layout, level layout groups, are given opportunities to be creative, but their creativity is circumscribed by the intended rule set of the game. I do want to add a, a few more things, though, which do admittedly take your macro design document beyond five pages. You may have quite a few pages of this stuff, depending on your game. Uh, you should count on having a pretty solid story that you uh, don't intend to, to change, and enough conceptual art 
to frame your look just as your macro chart frames your gameplay. I'll also add one more thing, which is that uh, this is just specific to holistic games concerning acquired abilities or inventory. If later level construction depends heavily on abilities learned in earlier levels, for example, um, you learn a gliding mechanic or how to use explosives, then the, the designers will need a lot of information in order to make levels or areas which properly interrelate with each other. These documents can get very large and, uh, as I said earlier, require substantial, a substantially greater amount of prototyping during pre the pre-production phase. Let's take a quick look at the micro design, which is the day-to-day uh, -day work of the designers during production. For the most part, they'll be working on specific levels. Pretty much the design task is to take single lines from the macro and based on them create true level maps, enemy descriptions and behaviors, puzzle descriptions and behaviors, special gameplay descriptions, and all the detailed documentation required to create a level. Now, I'm sure one big question is, why not create all of this documentation prior to entering production? Let's look at this globally. You start by hunting for some fresh, interesting gameplay. Once you have first playable, you codify the underlying structure that makes it work, and you call it the macro design. And also, uh, you have your two level prototypes, which are really the best documentation for the game that you could ever hope to have. You now have a choice. You can design out the rest of the game while the team waits, or since you know everything you need to know except the details, you can make the game. Uh, not a very tough choice. There's an even better reason, too, which is that as good as your pre-production may have been, you'll still learn things in production. Certain techniques, cameras, gameplays may work better than others. So, so long as you don't violate your macro design, uh, you can advance the state of the art in the game during production with confidence that you will not break the continuity or consistency of the experience. Let's go to the final keystone of method, game testing. Or more accurately, gameplay testing. And it's corresponding myth. If you want to make a hit, listen to the consumer. You all know what I'm talking about here, the focus test. If you want to know what features to put in your game or what type of game you should make, the last thing you want to do is have a focus test. Here are some of the great things you can learn from a focus test. What's popular? Ask what kind of game is hip right now, and the best you can, find, the best you can hope for is to find out what was popular the moment before your group came into the room. Unless you are planning on releasing your game within the next few weeks, this information is all but useless to you. Focus testers will not tell you the future. How not to stand out. Humans are by nature pack animals. If you don't believe this statement, you haven't been to a focus test. The suggestions put forth at a focus test are not designed to stand out. They are designed to gain approval and to blend in. To create a game that sells, you need something that stands out. The feature list of every game that was pretty good. If you want a nice list of features that have already been done on games that have nothing to do with your game, transcribe your focus test. It'll be great. Having said all that, a type of testing is one of the four keystones of method, uh, which is game testing. Once you have a good piece of your game done, maybe a third, it's time for gameplay testing. The gameplay test may involve sitting in the same room as the focus test, and it may involve uh, finding your players, uh, recruiting your players like you might do for a focus test, but that's where the similarities end. Gameplay testing has almost nothing to do with focus testing. Now, I not only advocate gameplay testing and religiously do it, I also consider it one of the pillars of method. I believe no game should be released without having been formally and extensively gameplay tested at least two times during the project maybe four or five. Gameplay testing is simply putting your game in front of consumers, mostly the same consumers that, you're, that you intend to sell your game to, and watching them play. I may not trust what consumers say, but I trust what they do completely. In fact, when scheduling your production phase, you should schedule in one complete month of designer time to be spent in the room during form formal gameplay testing. Gameplay testing should also be Analyze not subjectively, but as much as possible quantitatively. You may observe one player dying a lot on one level, <clears throat> but maybe that's an anomaly. <clears throat> you, 
you need to be able to derive statistics from your gameplay test that will allow you to tune your game to a high degree of accuracy. I'll give you an example. For Crash Bandicoot 2 in Japan, we had significant difficulty issues. One of our Japanese producers, bless him, recorded the play sessions of over a dozen consumers and spent a, a sleepless week analyzing the resulting videotapes. The result was a map of the game, the entire game, marked to show every spot where more than three players died. He also created statistics on how long it took to complete each level for each player. We could then look at all the long levels, which were those that took more than 30 minutes to complete on average, and tune the difficulty by removing obstacles or enemies at the pinch points where the deaths occurred. At the same time, however, don't get too enamored by the statistics. What you believe represents fun is uh, almost always wrong. That's why it's so important to be in the room when, with the game players as they do the test. There's a lot that you can learn from body language. Uh, and your, com your compiled statistics may be able to show you how many players died. But they can't tell you whether the players were enjoying themselves or hating life. And that's really it for method. Now, if you're interested, here's what you need to do to set it up. The uh, publisher has to have a very high level of trust in the team and the will to create space for the team because pre-production, as I've defined it, doesn't exactly fit within the usual milestones and review process. The publisher also has to have the will to kill. If adequate progress isn't occurring, or if the team has reached first playable but the gameplay doesn't appear sufficiently compelling, time to kill the project. There's no point following this process if you're not going to hold the output of pre-production to a very high standard. The team has to be the best and the brightest. The team has to be committed to shooting for the stars. The first playable will end up being compared to the dominant released products in its category, so it won't do to have anything but the highest standards. That's it. If uh, all goes well during pre-production, you'll have a first playable that's fun to play, a macro design that blocks out the scope of the project, a project schedule that takes the game through Gold Master, and an accurate budget. And you should be able to nail down release timing exactly because you know precisely what you're making and what you're not. And that's really all. Thank you very much for your time today. So uh, I'd like to open up Q&A with a question I have uh, for Lorne, which is, I've just stood up here and said, you cannot plan it in, your, in advance. You will spend six to nine months just try, trying to figure out what the heck your game is. And yet there's this rumor that Lorne went into pre-production of his game with a 500-page document that described exactly what it is. And they built it. And the game was called Abe's Odyssey. So, is that true? And how did you do it? It's, uh, it's semi-true. One, one, I just want to say, Mark, I think that what you just talked about is so important for this industry to hear. We couldn't agree more. It's, it's outstanding. But uh, uh, they're making me get up here. On Abe's Odyssey, I mean, I think the struggle that most of us have encountered is that when we're trying to get games financed, you know, they're like, man, that's really interesting, Mark, but like, what's the game going to be? You know, so we deal with that conflict of like creating the illusion that we really know what we want, you know, and in then, order, and in then order to close the deal, building something else. I mean, we talked to Sherry and I came and talked to you at Universal before uh, we were in uh, bed with GT, right? Uh, and you saw that game design document back there. <laughs> Actually, I, I didn't see the design document until uh, it, it was already going. Uh, and it was, it was amazing. It, it, it looked like it had fallen through a time warp from the year 2005. 500 pages of charts, diagrams, unbelievable production design, and then the game coming up at the same time. Was... So, so I, I think like uh, we come from the film industry where pre-production is everything. You know? um, and if your script's not finalized before production starts, you know that it's going to be a bad film. Uh, in the, the game stuff, what happened is the characters, we really go into heavy production design. The, the gameplay, we try to conceptualize. 
I mean, Munch's Odyssey was a classic case of why we, we sort of failed in the production, in the pre-production design process. Is we had a, a, a team of programmers who were like, no, we want everything absolutely defined before we write anything because you're going to change your mind and this is going to happen. It's like, no, 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 no. See, it's an organic process and we need to be able to feel it. And if it doesn't feel right. And so there's a huge document created. A lot of time was wasted and uh, a lot of that stuff just didn't, what, didn't wind up showing up in the code. In Abe's Odyssey, it was very similar, but the, the game, it, it's always been, at Oddworld, uh, historically, we've always had a lot of struggles with code, and, and I think we all do. Uh, but a lot of the ideas of what were conceptualized were, were up here, and then what we were able to achieve you know, kind of wound up here, so it was a process of trying to synthesize what we could do with what we wanted to do, and then I call it reactionary design. You know, where you're a game designer going, shit, it's just not working, and we've got X amount of days, we've got to figure this out before we get it straight. So it, it didn't, the story more clearly manifest from beginning to end, which I think is the most critical part if you're making the cinematic story-ish type of entertainment experience. But the gameplay itself went through several transmutations, and I, I don't know how it wouldn't. And, and everything you just described is exactly how we've moved forward since, uh, you know, our last project into the next. Well, great. And so I think it's very important to try and build enough structure not to have a goal. But how do you have enough of a goal so that those guys feel like they're going in the same direction? At least what's your answer to that? To that? Well, it's, it's the real level prototypes in that uh, you, you, are, you are really making levels of your game. You are trying like hell to make um, pieces of compelling entertainment. It's just you have to acknowledge that even though you say, OK, great, here's what we're going to do and spend a month or two making it, that when you're done, it probably isn't going to work well enough that you should be finishing up the project for however many million dollars and completing it. So that's the idea of iterating the real level prototypes. They all look like real games. They just aren't games that you'd want to make. And you have very, very defined goals and schedules in that six weeks, two months when you're making them. Use micro goals instead, yeah. So there's no long term planning and scheduling, but oh yeah, oh god, you're working very hard under extreme pressure and you're trying to pull everything together uh, every month or two. Uh, I guess I have a similar question. Uh, I think the method you've outlined is dead on. The, the question that always comes from the publisher is, OK, how long will pre-production take? Uh, do you have any advice about how to give a proper answer to that question? Uh, six to nine months is pretty good with a large team. If you have a smaller team, uh, a year is fine. You're really not spending that much money compared to what you will have to spend to make that ultimate product. Thanks. Hi there, I have a two-part question regarding sequels. At what, part, at what point in the original first generation game could you begin the pre-production of a sequel? And secondly, within the framework of the timeline that you showed before, how does a sequel's development differ from a first generation game? So a sequel, um, if it's uh, as similar as Crash 1, 2, and 3, or the Spyros, is really uh, not the same fundamental act of creation. Uh, it's a lot easier to do and uh, very brief pre-production. As far as when you can start, I, I imagine you could start pre-production of your sequel midway through production of the original game. Yes. Uh, well, three months. Uh, if that. Uh, sometimes none at all. Uh, Crash 3, we, we just jumped up and did, jumped in and did it. Uh, we were up and running the first month of the project. So it, I guess it depends with the familiarity. If you're jumping hardwares or you really want to modify something significant about the game that you're making, you'll obviously need to check that out. But you can get in a groove, thank God. If they were all as hard as original products, I don't know what we do. Do you have any experience or advice with a massively multiplayer game where the first playable demo, you know, requires a thousand people? Wow. What should we do? Wow. I know. Uh, <laughs> sounds interesting. Uh, sounds like you need uh, a thousand friends to, to check it out. <laughs> 
I mean, we, we do have to, we, we have to find ways. These are so expensive now. I mean, our projects are now climbing past $10 million in some cases. And that, I mean, I'm not even bringing up the, the big ones like Shenmue or the Final Fantasy series that are reportedly in the 20, 30, $80 million range. Uh, so we have to find ways to leverage that risk. And, and, and the best tool we can have is just make a piece of it and see if we, we should bother going forward. There was an expression that they used in the book, Barbarians at the Gate. Uh, they kept referring to putting your dick on the anvil. And uh, it sounds like a lot of what your, uh, your methodology is aimed at, you know, with you have a lot of responsibility for a lot of money, and yet you want to take this thing and you want to put all that money on a creative risk. I found that there seems to be a, uh, a diametric opposition between being responsible for money and taking a creative risk, at least in the eyes of a lot of investors. A, is that an illusion? And B, if it's not an illusion, how do you break through it? Do you consider, when you say creativity, do you consider the projects that I mentioned today to be creative? Yes, I do. Uh, this is sort of why I I tried to wrap up with how do you do this, is you, you really have to have a unique publisher team bond. Mm -hmm. And you really have to have a publisher that's willing to move a bit away for six or nine months, and a team that is ready for, to shoot for the stars. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be in that situation a uh, number of times. Uh, so you'd advise us to be lucky? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, here, I'm here today to speak to the teams, to, to, to tell them to ask for this, and to speak to the production executives, to tell them that this is what they should be doing, really, Thank you in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to have both audiences here today. Mark, I was wondering if you had any more uh, items from the list of user testing, because uh, I've done a lot of user testing before, and I tend to have a lot of marketing people wanting to come in and hijack those tests. And, and I saw, you know, the, some of the items you have were really good. I was wondering if you had more of yeah, those. Yeah, I, I dramatically, I cut that down. I okay. wasn't sure how interesting it would be to today's audience. We actually do focus tests as well. We just don't ask very many questions. The focus testing methodology consists in asking what we call no questions, which is that um, we show things to the consumers and we either get the response, hell no, or anything else, and we don't care about if it's a good response or a great response. I think uh, Lauren may have touched on this about a little earlier is, you have to have something that stands out and your consumers may not instantly gravitate towards it, but it helps you because it looks so dramatically different from everything else out on the marketplace. If what you're showing consumers, now I'm talking about characters and the like, is right. that are really, enthousi uh, really enthusiastic about it, it's probably too familiar to them and you should be looking for something else. So, um, Yes, focus testing with a grain of salt. Then the gameplay testing, uh, we, uh, there are a bunch of people who come through there. It, we do talk to them a bit. Um, it's brutally difficult to understand what players are saying. A good example is, um, well, we, we go more by statistics than the words. So let's say a player says, your game is too easy, unsolicited. Uh, well, maybe that's a sign that your player is showing off and wants yeah. to impress you. Let's say that the player is saying your game is too hard. This is usually based on the feeling that all players have that the game should be uniquely simple for them but hard for everyone else because they're uniquely gifted players. And then I've heard the same player say one af right after the other. First, it's too easy and then it's too hard. So what we really try to do is take the statistics and what they're saying and bring them together. So uh, they're saying uh, it's too hard, but were they enjoying it? What did their body language say? What did their statistics say? Uh, body language is great and doesn't change that much world around. When I do this in Tokyo, you can tell just as easily as you can tell in the States. Um, are they hunched? Are they, are they hunched forward? Are they leaning back? Have they tensed up? Are they looking at other people's monitors and the like? Yeah, I, I find that if I also record their face as the game, you can see their eyes and their eyes don't lie. All right, Jez, uh, last question. Hey, Mark. Hi, Jez. Uh, um, going back to the, um, the previous discussion, um, the question before this one, on um, how to get publishers to sign up uh, to um, high-risk uh, pre-production schedules uh, or unscheduled. Uh, just from our own experience, we find 
um, most publishers wouldn't do that, and that you're the exception. Uh, <laughs> um, the way we do it is, unfortunately, as a developer, we take the risk, and we do much of what you say, but without publisher involvement until first playable. And then publishers will sign up, and we've reduced a lot of their risk. But that requires some yeah. other form of finance. I really wish we could change the way we do this in general. I, I think the publishers, we need the investment and the ability to take risks. And it needs to be coupled with the will to kill, that these things will be held to incredibly high standards when they're done. That's sort of the pitch to everyone today. I guess that's it. Thank you very much.